If you guys tuned in for last month's quick tip, then you'll know all about my dear friend Hubert. We talked about some magical effects, we talked about some Vex. Now I want to go over some ideas and considerations when rendering. The challenge for today is how do you take particles and turn them into something like what we see right here? I, this isn't really like a hairy magical effect. I wouldn't describe it like that, but it's these strands of magic that follow the particle's path. How do we get this sort of magical feel to render with just spheres and particles? Well, we're going to do that primarily with the use of the particle trail sop. This particle trail sop is brand new to Houdini 19. So keep that in mind if you're working with an older version of Houdini, but it's there to create trails of where the particle goes. Okay, and that's how we get that motion captured in a strand that we see right here. Okay, well, suppose that you cache this out. If I middle mouse at frame 57, I have about a million point two particles. So we're looking for about a million, maybe a little bit less, maybe a bit more, but somewhere around here is a good particle count for this particular situation. Now, the first thing I do whenever I have a particle sim that's cached out is I throw down a retime node. That allows us to figure out those in-between frames, those subframes as the particle is moving. So just to show this, so that we're very clear on what I'm trying to do here, if let's say a particle is right here on frame 10, and it's right here on frame 11, I want to be sure that I have the ability to calculate the particle at any location in between those frames. And instead of caching out substeps, which takes a lot of data, all you need to do is use this retime with the point ID there. That's how it knows how to identify the point from one frame to the next. And if we go up here, our range is the same range for our whole scene. And we just check on the interpolate between input frames. That will give us what we need. That's important when using these trail operations because sometimes you need to figure out those in-between spots. Now, on to the main attraction. We have our particle trail sop. What if we make a new one and before we adjust parameters, we delete a bunch of points so that we're not waiting around to see what our settings do? That would be a swell idea. So, start off by doing a group where is it? Group by range. This will allow us to select every other point. And so let's call this our delete points, group type points, and we will select, let's say five or one out of every five right there. Now, if we do a blast, we can go ahead and say delete everything except for the delete points. Middle mouse, now we're down to a quarter million instead of a full 1.2 million. Much better. Okay, let's give ourselves some room here. I'll cover this other stuff here in a minute. But what we'll do is set down a brand new particle trail. And once we have that down, we can see that we have these lines, which is really cool. Up at the top, we have substeps, and this is designed to help improve the curvature of those trails. So if let's say we take up our substeps to a value of three, that might help us get the curvature along these points, or maybe even four. So let's do four substeps right here, and then we go down to the shape, we can change this frame duration to dictate how long those trails are. So for that frame duration, let's say five frames. And there we go. Now we have this furry looking business going on. Let's take this all the way up to seven, like so. And now that we have this, 
we need to start thinking about how this is going to be shaded. One of the more difficult things about these strands is getting it to blend smoothly with Hubert. If we look back here, it's not like we have a bunch of pokey, jagged edges along these hair-like strands. If you have those sharp edges, it just looks kind of cheap. It doesn't look as nice, it doesn't blend into the model. So, what we can do to help with that is a few things. For one, on our alpha, we can set this to scale along the length. And what I like doing for this particular situation is I like having both ends down all the way and then only towards the middle is it going to widen. Eventually this will render out as strands, so think polygonal strips, right? And I want the middle to be the largest and then I want it to taper off. So, just to visualize this in our heads, I like being very visual about these things. If we were to take a visualization, what I'm saying right now is in the alpha, right now our strip looks like this. We want it to be the most opaque right here and to disappear along the edges. That's what's happening right now. Okay, so there we go. That's what happens in the alpha. We also have the ability to scale over in the normalized age. So I like doing the same exact thing, like that. Also, as you can imagine, we can do the same thing for color. We can color along the length. And the fun thing about this is we can have both sides be black, and then in the middle, we can set this to whatever we want. So let's say red, and then maybe along here, some kind of green, maybe along here, some kind of blue. Whatever you really want to do for that particular situation. It's all up to your artistic design here, but <laughs> something like this ought to work just fine. So we'll go probably something around here like that. Okay, now we have these attributes. If we middle mouse, we basically have alpha and color. So there's alpha, that's our opacity and CD is going to be our color. If you're using Mantra, I believe, or Karma, same thing, I believe that these attributes will be automatically detected by the shader. However, if we go to Redshift, which is what I'm using in this situation, or any other render engine, you'll need to bring in those attributes. So here I have the Magic Lines shader, and we have a particle attribute lookup that brings in that data. So here's alpha, that plugs into the opacity color to make it disappear at the edges. And we have CD color right there, and that eventually ends up in the emission color to make it glow. Okay, that is the main ingredients that we want from this thing. And that's the nice thing about using this particle trail SOP. You could do all of this in VEX, but again, it's nice to just have this conveniently here for you so that you're not, you know, wasting time trying to invent the wheel for this kind of stuff. Okay, there's one last thing that I like to talk about that also helps blend this in really nicely. If we go to the shape tab, we can go down and have this width parameter right here. If we middle mouse, we have width that is how large the strand is going to be. And as you can imagine, we can do this kind of thing again. And we can also scale over the normalized age like so. And we can also add a bit of noise if you'd like. In this case, I'm not going to add noise. I like having a more smooth version of the strand shapes but that is an option there as well. Once we have all that, I like to then take the width and use that as P scale with Redshift. So if we create a point wrangle, we can then say a couple of things. For one, P scale is going to be equal to the width, like that. So there's float P scale is equal to float width. 
Also, I'd like the emission to turn up as the scale of the strand turns up. So I can also say f at emiss weight is equal to p scale, like so. And guess what? In our shader, here we have emission weight. So as the strand gets larger, and let me just draw this out real quick. Let's say that our strand looks something like this. They're kind of tiny, but they make this shape in general towards the center is most opaque. It goes to transparent towards the edges. What we're saying that P scale is large right here. And as it gets larger, I want our emission to also go up in value. So that's what's happening there with the emiss weight. And really you do that for all of those elements and that's what's going to help blend in these strands nicely to the model. After a quick test render, we end up with Fiery Hubert. He's looking a bit more evil than we're used to seeing Hubert look, but still very fiery, which is really cool. Now from here, it's up to you. Do you like having the particles away from the surface that much? You may, if you wanna have a more chaotic look, or you might wanna get those particles closer towards Hubert's body. We already talked about in the last quick tip how we can use a gravity in the simulation itself that brings everything closer towards Hubert's body, but we can do something after the fact as well if we wanna get those particles trimmed off near the surface. Here's how that works. The main idea is that we want to take a version of Hubert over here. That's basically a expanded SDF volume. So here's Hubert, turn it into an SDF volume. We dilate that, convert it back over here into a fog. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to multiply against P scale. If we take a volume slice of that volume right there, what we'll find is that the values here are clipping to one inside of that volume. Some of the particles, some of the strands are falling outside of that into this purple zone. And if we say that the P scale in the purple zone is zero, it effectively removes those particles from the render. The node to make it all come together is a attribute from volume. And all we do here is we make a P scale multiply. So P scale molts, our volume is going to be surface. That's just the, the default name that was made here with the original volume. If we middle mouse this, it's called surface. And we plug that in. Once we have that, all we need to do now is actually take the attribute size here to one. This, this is a float attribute, point wrangle, and then p scale times equal the, what did we say? p scale molt right here, like that. And now if we do another test render, we'll see that those edges are cleaned up. And now as we can see, we've trimmed up those edges nicely. Kind of like giving him a little bit of a haircut, kind of like a buzz cut here for uh, this particle effect. <laughs> but anyway, that's the gist of what you do. Once you add back in the 1.2 million particles and you readjust the settings, you should end up with something along these lines right here. To get this glowy stuff, if you're using Redshift, you can adjust the bloom right here. That will take that red area and bloom it out. Same deal here with the streaks. And so that's what's happening right here. For more tutorials that are thorough, simplified, and straight to the point, check out cgforge.com. Here you can find all kinds of different videos. I have over 75 hours of content, and I also offer one-on-one -on -one mentorships and professional consultations through CG Forge Academy. I want to thank you for watching. I hope that you found this little rendering section fun 
and good luck forging your world.